Welcome back to Soul. Thank you. It is. It is. Good yes. to you. Thank you. Today is Shri M's Day. Today is <laughs> Wednesday, August fifteenth, two thousand and eighteen. As a famous comedian used to say, we're in beautiful downtown Burbank, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, California. I want to talk about many things, but you reminded me of a question that came to my mind. Listening to you speak to an audience in Burbank last night, you talked about the truth of who we are, Satchitananda, being awareness bliss. Yes. I've thought that now for many years, and I think of them all as being mutually independent but important. They're all equal, being awareness and bliss. But in my heart, I think of awareness being more equal. Is it? Yeah, I think so, because um, without basic awareness, you know, just not being aware of something, then there's no point in anything else. The most important thing is to be aware. Aware not only about ourselves when we close our eyes and look at ourselves in our mind, but also awareness of the outside world and how we interact with the outside world. This is also very important. And you're convinced you are positive awareness is eternal. I am convinced that awareness is not a, a product of the brain. Let's put it this way. Is the brain's temporal? Yeah. It's, it's, it's that which uh, understands everything that the brain conceives of, processes, and thinks about. This I'm convinced. I can't give you a scientific proof in a test tube, but... Uh, and are you equally convinced that that brain you just referred to is for all intents and purposes... Is what? Is for all intents and purposes the only, the only thought, the only mind? Yes. And you are part of it? Absolutely. See, we... Normally, we talk about the mind, but the mind has not been located anywhere in the body except in the brain. Now, so this is the brain, the mind we are talking about normally. We are saying that apart from that, there is an awareness and consciousness which is separate from it, but it uses the brain like a supercomputer and operates. Okay, so let me come to another question. Suppose, um, have we ever thought about this? Can we think without a language? No. Do infants think without a language? We don't know. But we, as grown-ups, we cannot think without a language. We can, and the feelings are there, of course. But the moment the feelings come, they're translated into words. And if you have to think, you might be thinking in German, English, Hindi, whichever language you're familiar with, you need language. So we are asking this question, is it possible to have thought, or I would say awareness, without a language? And the nearest thing I can think of in this world is music. I'm not talking about uh, uh, vocal music, I'm talking about instrumental music, like a symphony or something like that. You don't need a language to enjoy it, right? You don't have to interpret it, you just enjoy it. You may be from here, from India, from anywhere, but you enjoy it. But in a way, it is its own language. Uh, my, to compose music, you require your own language. But once music is on, then it transcends language. What I'm trying to say is one step better than language, trying to convey this. Which is why, in the ancient times, the rishis who looked into this, who experienced this, said, Yet vajana bhutitam, that which words cannot explain. But then we are stuck because without words we can't convey anything. Interesting you should say that. Later on I'm going to ask you about that very concept, mm -hmm. about words that cannot be used to explain the concept of self-realization. Later. Because also. we have nothing else with us to explain. Yeah, we'll come to that when you can. I, I, I should officially <laughs> welcome you again. It's been six years, for those who don't know, since I made the 11 hour trip from Puttaparthi, India to Madhnapali, India, it was not an easy trip. The driver was lost. We got there. We got there to interview you at your beautiful yeah. ashram. Uh, what is the most important thing that has happened to you? It's a silly reporter's question. Since the coming out of your autobiography, which really laid it all on the line, 
apprenticed to a Himalayan master, a yogi's autobiography. Can you reduce it to a concept that's happened to you since you made the world aware of this? Did you meet me last time before the autobiography was out? Or? Right after. Right, right after. And right after you were physically attacked also. Also? Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Shortly thereafter. You were okay. recuperating okay. when I came to you. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I think to put in a few words, what happened is I was living in Madhnapalli quietly, doing my things. A few people used to come and sit with me. There was no paraphernalia. You know what I mean? And then came the autobiography. Now, I couldn't stop writing the autobiography because my master, Babaji, had told me that I need, should do it at some point. So I did it. Now, with the coming of the autobiography, word spread that there's somebody sitting here who, who has gone through all this. So people started gathering. There were newspaper interviews. I would put it in uh, the words of a friend of mine who said, so the circus started. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> now the circus is on. And sometimes I despair and think I should get out. But then I look at the faces of people who are around me and say, what will happen if I get out? The whole thing will be a mess. Each person will define me in its own, you know, my different ways. And what I try to convey would be lost in this whole thing. So to put in a few words, I think that it became, uh, it grew into a, uh, an organization precisely. And organizations have their own problems. They can detract from the truth. Individuals have their own problems. Organizations have more problems. No. Individuals have problems which are a different kind. But the organizational problems is that even what you said and what you did can be, for the purpose of organization, misinterpreted. I don't know if you have, you know the story of the devil and his friend who went for a walk. I keep repeating it at all such songs. There's many stories about the devil, but this one I'm not familiar okay. with. <laughs> the devil and his friend went for a walk. So. The devil bent down and took something from the lawn and put it in his pocket. So his friend asked him, Hey, what did you pick up just now? So Satan said, Well, I picked up the truth. He said, You picked up the truth and put it in your pocket? Then your days are numbered because you're the opposite of truth. You're untruth, you're darkness. Your days are numbered. So watch out. So the devil smiled and tapped him on his shoulders and said, Ah, don't worry, friend, I'll organize it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, this is, I have to be very careful. That's one thing which I have to watch out in this. Since it has grown and become bigger and we have school and various things are happening. I have to stay sane in the midst of all this. Staying sane is important in a world where you will be misunderstood. Absolutely. We have to be There's very careful. no question care. about that. We have to be very careful. People will disbelieve you. Yeah. People will not hold you kindly. Absolutely. So we have to look at So you're it. in the circus right now. You're in the public world. Yeah, I don't know whether I'm managing the circus or I'm the clown in it, but I'm there. Does, you, does your wife like the circus? <laughs> this is a personal <laughs> question. To be honest, she doesn't. <laughs> I've said that because I knew the answer. Now, you told me six years ago that when your children were eight, you received what you called a dream signal to start your public service. Yeah. Would you describe a dream signal? Was it just a thought in a dream? I think it was not an ordinary dream. We have many ordinary dreams every night, but this was more something that stayed with me for six days on end. It would never get out of my head. It was a big circle. It was signal. very intense and very... And it, came, it happened in a very innocuous way. I mean, like... Um, one of my friends, um, who was a jeweler in uh, Bangalore, somebody went to him, an old classmate of mine, went to him with some jewelry for evaluating or something like that. And uh, he saw this man with a picture of Muktananda or somebody there in his, room, in his shop. So he said about spiritual matters and uh, him. He said, oh, I have a friend, you know, he's not well known, but he has gone to the Himalayas, he has lived with his master. We few people know because he talks to us. 
So this guy said, okay, so can I, is it possible to catch him? Because he was a member of the Theosophical Society. This guy said, well, um, I don't know that, but I know his mother and sister live in Bangalore, so he might turn up sometime. So I can ask him uh, uh, to see you. And he said, what's his name? He said, my name. And he said, oh, but I know him because he has already come here once or twice, but he didn't say a word <laughs> about anything. So when I went again, my mother-in-law's jewelry or something I had to give to him for cleaning. He said, hey, you never told me about this. Yeah, I believe you have gone to the Himalayas. I said, yeah, but I don't like to talk about it much. Okay, then he said, can we have a talk at the Theosophical Society? I said, no, I don't talk anywhere in public. I've never done it. I went back. I, then I went back to Madhinapalli. That night, I had this dream where I was sitting in a railway coach. You know, and inside, the, I was inside the coach. And before I got into the coach, I saw that there was a, a banner uh, on the uh, train which said, the Satsang Foundation. I said, what kind of satsang foundation is this? Anyhow, I got and I thought they're taking me to the satsang foundation. Which, by the way, is the name of your current. No. <laughs> so that's how it happened. So I in looked. A dream. Yeah. So I looked out of the uh, window and in the station, I saw the station master and I burst out laughing because it was not this normal station master, it was Maheshwarnath Babaji with his matted hair here. Who you remembered from the age of, course, of 19. Of course. And on the top of the matted hair, he had kind of uh, kept a guard's hat, white hat, which was sitting on top in a very funny angle. And no shoes, no footwear, and but wearing the uniform. And he had a blue, green light in his hand, which he was kind of swinging this way. Uh, I thought, is he showing me some kind of a green light, a signal to go? Yeah. Well, I forgot about it. but. When I wake, woke up in the morning, it kept coming. And there was one more week to go to Bangalore because he was suggesting that maybe if I come on a Sunday, we can have it. I thought about it. Six days, it kept coming back. Then I said, let me, uh, when I go back, I'll decide. So I went back and Mohan said, can we have a talk? I said, well, I can talk to you about the Himalayas. He said, fine, that's great. So on Sunday, I can't remember the date and the year. We had this talk, and I thought it was going to be a small private group in the Theosophical Society. Uh, when I went there, the, there were 100 people in the hall, and there were butterflies in my stomach. Mm. I don't know what to say. I've never addressed a public gathering. So I said to myself, OK, let me concentrate on the guy sitting in front of me and talk. Forget about the rest. So I talked. Apparently, it went on for an hour, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> and then they said, "Oh, this is great! So, can you come back again?" So, then it started moving, and this Mohan, who took me to the Theosophical Society, was the guy who kept saying, "We have to form an organization," and so we started it. And they wanted a name, and I said, "I don't want anything with my personal name on it. Nothing, not even M." Mm -hmm. So otherwise they would have made it the M Foundation. So it's the Satsang Foundation. So we got that. It's a wonderful story. Do you tell that story often? No. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Yeah. These details are important. Yeah. They, I they don't not usually add credibility to the overall stories which are out of this I world. know, I know. They add they add weight, they add significance to it. You also told me back then, six years ago, when you, on the spiritual path, that when you find teachers along the path, don't ask for cheap things that they have to offer. Ask for the real thing. So, let me ask you, Shriya, what is the real thing, the real lesson, that you have to offer that would give us better understanding of why you're here? That's because it's fairly easy to get cheap things. You know? I mean, when I say cheap thing, I mean things which are irrelevant. Yeah. But it's difficult to uh, talk about uh, more important things. But if I go to five people, the five people might be able to do things which I can't do probably. But 
Um, among them, there may be one who really can change your heart, change your psyche. I think that's more important. So uh, I had this good luck that when my youth, at the age of 19, I found this wonderful man called... You found you at the age oh, of nine? Oh, you found me, but afterwards, of course, at the age of 19. So I had this... Uh, A man who, I don't know if he's a man or what, but he was more concerned with changing the heart to changing one's spiritual content and not about any small, tidy little things that, you know, everybody can do that. I, I told you last time, I did something and I said, it's not a big deal. Uh, if you be with me for uh, seven days, I can let you know how to do this. But the thing is to change the heart. I know you know, there are people who just put their hand like this and then they keep the hand and they say, oh, this is robotic. I mean, no big deal, you know what I mean? If you be with me for seven days, I can teach you how to do this. It's not a big deal. This is what you did six years ago. I'm doing it again, but I don't do it ever. I'm doing it, Ted is a special man for me. <laughs> You've done it at least once before, I know, but I won't embarrass Can somebody you take this away because I need to wipe my hands? There's, there's one story that I've heard of you doing it for someone else. Paper. And, and he, w he thought it was very auspicious. No, oh, it may be auspicious, but it's not so important. <laughs> and, and this, would you call this? Thank you. I won't spoil it. <laughs> I think she wants you to. <laughs> Usually for some other people, there are always people with handkerchiefs. I don't have anybody. Okay. Thank so you if, so much. So if this is not the real thing that you have to offer that you told me back then, mm -hmm. what is the real thing? What is the real, the serious real Look, lesson? what, sorry. And this, this will remain forever. It's not something that's appear and disappear. You can keep it and you'll see it's there after six years. But what I'm trying to say is that what, it, what happened now was, what came out was bibhuti, right? Mm -hmm. Now bibhuti is ash. And ash is where we all go in the end. Right. That's the end. You go to Banaras and look at the Manikarnika ghat. And ash does not break down further. So therefore, to understand that this is the end of all life and to look for something that is permanent, which is our true inner being, which is awareness. And once you touch that, actually you can do anything, but you don't want to do anything because you have no desires left. Because you are in touch with an energy which is um, difficult to define. In fact, you should be careful that it doesn't go out of hand. Mm -hmm. So, what I mean is, this I found with Mahishwanath Babaji. He was a man who could, I think if he wanted, turn the world upside down. But no, if I was hungry, he would ask me, either you go and beg for food or I bring food for you. I am sure that he could have produced food at the wave of a hand. I've seen it in urgent circumstances for somebody else, but he didn't do that. So, what he did was, with his touch and with his presence and with his teachings, he managed to change my heart and clean it up. When I say heart, of course, you know, it's not the organ that pumps sure. blood. My, my awareness into something much larger than uh, the, the, the little petty little self that we always are concentrating on. I think that is most important. Uh, nothing else. And if you touch that, somebody said this in Jerusalem a thousand years ago. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of the Lord and the rest shall be added unto you. Um, I have never consciously tried to look after myself physical, in the physical world, material world, but it happens. Which reminds me of a question last night. Somebody said, do you have to believe in God to be in yoga, to be on a path? You don't have to believe in God, you need to find God. 
<laughs> you can start with the premise that perhaps it's there. It's easier to accept something, a positive hypothesis, than a negative hypothesis. You don't have to start by saying not there. But if you say not there, then you will have no exploration possible. I think of atheists as having a stronger faith than perhaps I do. They know of the non-existence of They God. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they do. They don't know. They, they think they know. They think they know. We can think many things. We can think, but it may it may not fit into the normal uh, definitions that we have made for God. We have to watch out on that. I have to watch out on time. I've got seven okay. pages of questions, and I'll never get through sure, one. Sure, sure. <laughs> I heard you say again recently about our search for higher consciousness, and you put it this way: that which we seek is everywhere. So how do we find something that's already here in front of us? That's the thing. If something was far away and you need to go there, then it's a linear progression, right? From here you need to go there. Same question. What happens if it's everywhere? Not only here, but everywhere and here. So perhaps when the mind stops its cravings, stops all the grasping, when you say grasp, which means I'm here and I'm trying to grasp something there. All that ceases and the mind says, okay, this is not the way, let me give up. Because I'm not going to find it through any kind of mental circus. So let me just be. Then perhaps you find it. Not when you're trying to reach it here, there, it's not possible. I think when all reaching stops, and when the mind says, this puny little brain cannot understand it. Shut up. <laughs> then something happens. <laughs> tough to get to that level. It's tough. It's very tough. You have to go through many experiences. It's good, actually. You talk about the three stages of consciousness ever since I've known of you, starting with the book that I've read uh, these many years ago, Waking mm -hmm. State, the Dream State, the Deep State. But you also talk about the other state upon which all of these are built. I'll call it the higher consciousness state. Was that state first revealed to you as a little child or by your teachers? No, your teachers? no, later. Later, later? Later by my teacher, not immediately after he met me, but after I lived with him for some time. And, yes, we're not about it. Yes, and he was told, he, he, he was of the kind who wanted all experiences to be mine and not his. So he didn't say it's this. He said, find out for yourself. He did help me to find it. No, no question about that. But it was one and a half years after I met Maheshwar Nath Babaji, roughly one and a half years, that for the first time I had an inkling of what that is. But of course, after I had that, I got this memory that perhaps I knew this before. That's a different story. But in this life till then I didn't know anything. Well, I, I imagined, I tried, but... <laughs> So would you equate this higher consciousness with awakening, with self-realization? It's a little uh, tricky to use the word self-realization, but I would say, uh, yeah, that was probably the starting point for me, because it was kind of a opening of the door. So it happens by degree? Yeah, it doesn't happen by itself. And do you go there, lose it? And go back? No, you don't lose it. You go progressively up. <laughs> so you've been going up for a long time. Once you catch it, you can't go down. I mean, it's impossible to fall. You, 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 I couldn't help but write this down because you talk freely about ego and how everybody has ego and that you, how you have it. And if somebody scratches you on the Even wall, I do. you react to it. Mm -hmm. I would think somebody going through the process of awakening higher degrees of self-realization, call it what you will, for them ego would disappear. No. This is a misconception. The ego will be a good ego. Oh, a good ego. A positive ego. It's not a negative ego. It's not that it does. You, it will disappear at death. But at death, yeah. till then, till then, you cannot even function if you don't have an ego. So you need it may, it. Yeah, it may be a shadow of an ego, but it's there, but it's a good one. It's not something that's thinking of harming others, it's not something that thinks negatively, it's a positive ego. That's why sometimes when a person has that, you mistake this guy sometimes to be egotistic, but he's not. He, he, he can't help it, it's there, the pure ego shines through. <laughs> you talk about the mind a lot. You say, 
times, I've heard you say, mine is an illusion. If that's the case, what <coughs> tools can we use to further awaken us if we cannot use the mind? I didn't say that the mind is an illusion. As long as it lasts, it's very real. But there are ways and means to understand that in the end, it doesn't matter really. Yeah, I won't say it's an illusion when it's... Like, I'm sitting here and talking to you. It's the mind and the body both which are in action. This is not an illusion. Yeah, from the ultimate point of view, you might think that uh, because this is happening now and next minute it's not there, so it's not real. Mm -hmm. That's a different matter. But while it's happening, it's very real. That helps me understand the follow-up question, which was confusing. Uh, you say on the one hand, you make the argument that life is illusory, which I've heard you say many times. Yet on another hand, you say this life is real, but that it is merely impermanent. That's what I mean. It's not illusory. I would like to correct that statement once for all so that there is no confusion. It's not an illusion. It's impermanent. And impermanent and inaccurate. Our, our understanding of this world is completely inappropriate and uh, because we are always looking at it from the colored glasses that we wear of desires. So we really don't see it. The world exists, of course. It's world, you can't say the world doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist as we think it exists. Mm -hmm. This is important to know. And, and how can we possibly know otherwise? I mean, so, therefore, <laughs> therefore, the world that we know today, everything that we know today, is a result of the uh, data, information fed to us by our five sensor organs, five organs of perception, then uh, uh, processed by our supercomputer and presented to us. This is what we see. We don't see the actual. We see depending on how the sense is projected. So, and then the mind works on that projection and sorts things out. So that's what we see. We're really not in communion with this earth. Real earth is pure existence. And what we see... So it's a figure of speech. Yes. All that exists All that exi is that. Is that. Shit. It's not a figure of speech, it's a reality. It is that. I'm not saying that something doesn't exist. It exists, but it doesn't exist as we think it exists. Yeah. It exists in existence, but not as we project. Because we have only the idea that is produced by our sense organs, and which are very limited. And sometimes even uh, misleading. And then out of that, the brain processes out and says, this is my rational framework. I've seen this. A flower is like this. I'm saying, what if some, there is an organism whose eyes are different? It would see the flower different. I don't, you, it's very easy, common sense. The household fly has a compound eye. Many eyes. So it may be seeing the flower as completely different. So it's not an easy question to deal with no. anybody. I hope you're patient with me. I'm aware of my time. I'm editing questions as I go along. I'm throwing out good questions to get to this, and then we'll get back to regular questions. I'm very comfortable with you. So far. <laughs> a, a quarter of a million people, I'm very happy to say, it makes me feel like your message is reaching people uh, way beyond what I ever expected. They've seen our interview from six years ago on Soul Journeys in 2012. Many of those people write me, and they still have the same question. They want more details about a topic we talked about. I would be remiss if I didn't follow up with your previous interview, if you would kindly explain more experiences with your teachers, Maheshwanath Babaji, Mahavatar Babaji, I don't think you would use that name to call him that, Shruti Sai Baba. Are you the only person to have such experiences that you know of? There must be many more people. You're not aware of any. I'm not. Uh, I've never heard of anybody else. Maybe they're not talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I can't be an exception. It's not possible. So you think there are others? Huh? You think there are others? I am sure there are others. Uh, they may be unknown. I have a job, so I'm doing it. So I'm known. It's Babaji's problem. But um, I think there are many unknown. You know what? I have seen people who are not known anywhere in the outside world, who have no internet, who have nothing, who live quietly, 
uh, in a small remote village somewhere in the mountains. It need not necessarily be the Himalayas. They have a cow, they sell milk, they drink milk, they have a small plot of land, they eat the food. I've seen some people who have extraordinarily advanced and seen things which we cannot even imagine, even I cannot imagine. So I'm not a great person. <laughs> they're greater than me. But they're not known. Well, you're now known. Now <laughs> I'm known, yeah. Uh, let's begin with uh, Maheshwarnath. Babaji left his body many years ago, but I assume you still hear from him. In fact, I'm sure you do. He, he advises you and he commands you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but it's not so. Um, in fact, I don't need to, because just before he left his physical body, now this is a strange thing, he, he said he was going to give 50% of what was in him into me. Not a possession, more like an energy. So with that inside, with that uh, now flowing through my system, I don't need to ask him what do things. I'm on my own. Uh, so I don't keep in touch with him. Oh, well, because of my love and affection, I very often think of it. Yes. Uh, sometimes, rarely, I dream of him. But I don't see him in visions or anything of that kind because it's not required. You see, normally we see somebody when we want to discuss some matters or try to ask questions. and It always comes to me now, so I don't need to ask him. There's another concept too. I mean, I, you don't seem to talk much about uh, Vedanta, Advaita, the oneness, non-duality. But you talk about it in other terminology yeah. all the time. So if you are part of the awakening or self-realized status that <clears throat> is our is our birthright, <laughs> yeah. To whom would you pray? So why? Would I don't you, pray. I was going to say, why would you pray to your teacher? I don't pray. I might pray to myself. <laughs> well, that makes sense. No, not as a human being, as right. him, but yourself as the one, the, as, the as inner as self, the inner self. I want to make sure people understand. The, the inner self is not Mahishwarnath Babaji. Mahishwarnath Babaji's inner self and my inner self and same. your inner self are the same. Mm -hmm. So I turn in and pray. And I, I don't want, I don't have to say, oh, I lack this, give me that. Because if the inner self knows before I say. Don't you think this is a very important lesson for others to hear over and over again? About yeah, the non-duality, the people, existence? People pray saying, I want this. I want. Who are you praying to? The one who you're praying to, suppose he's your antaryami, one who sits inside your heart. He knows everything that you need. Why are you asking him? Better put me more in touch with you would be a better prayer. So, Mahavatar Babaji, my word, that's, that's, that's something. also, you don't pray. I mean, do you, do you, does he <laughs> communicate to you still this 500-year-old mythical person who you know it's is not a myth mythical person who you know is not mythical <laughs> well it's not a he's not a mythical he or whatever it is is not a mythical person and i can't say anything about this because it's i consider it sacred boundaries which i cannot cross i don't want to say anything about this yeah sometimes it's not prayer but one likes to adore such beings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and touch their feet once in a while uh, because it's, I have also in my past, if you believe in past lives, in my past, been with Sri Guru. We call him Sri Guru Babaji. I've been with Sri Guru Babaji as his disciple. So for me, there is a very intimate relationship. And unlike Mahesh or Nath Babaji, he will not leave and go away. He's not going to die to attain samadhi and leave his body. It's not going to happen. If he has to go, he'll fade away. But Still there. Is Sri Guru Babaji still on this plane yeah. for people? Yeah. Do you come across people who yeah. encounter him? Still well, if, I don't know. I can't be sure because, because there's so much Babaji in the internet now mm -hmm. yeah. that many people might imagine they saw Babaji. So I can't comment on that. But that such a being exists and very much active even now, I have no doubt about. 
your book speaks about this in vivid detail, and I'm going to make a guess that most people believe every word of what you've spoken. I'm not so sure. Well, I, I, I don't hope. know either, but if they get from page one to the last page, I might guess that by that time they might become aware that this man believes what he's saying to be true. Of course. That I ask. Whether it's right or wrong, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. But I believe what I've said. So I understand why you're reluctant to reveal some of the innermost intimate exchanges. So let's go to another teacher, Shirdi Sai Baba. He died, his physical form died in 1918. You met him in the flesh. We're in a room with another man, and the only other man I know in the world who came with me, uh, who met him in the flesh. While telling me about your encounter with Shirdi Sai Baba, you told me that he had much to say about him, but that this is, that six years ago was not the time to say it. When, if not now, to say it, you're going to be 70 years old. You're an <laughs> old man. I can say that because I'm a couple of years older than you okay. are. If, if, when, if not now, to share these insights. We still time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not trying to escape from this, but uh, I know I told you that six years ago, and I still need to say that it's time for this. We can't say everything that happened. Can you categorize, give us a little insight as to what we can expect when you do choose to share this? Mm, it's, it was mostly a kind of breaking down of uh, many images and uh, many convictions which I falsely had about spiritual matters. Mm -hmm. He was setting the And Maheshwarnath Babaji was with me. At the time? Yes. So, without him I couldn't have gone in and seen him. Did you not also meet him as a young boy? Or was that just only Maheshwarnath? Yeah. No. Okay, so you met Shirdi Sai Baba in the flesh, in the physical form, well after he died. You weren't born in 1918. No, no. You weren't alive. With your teacher. Yeah. And did your was your teacher surprised? Was your teacher no. impressed with the No, lessons? I think he knew what's going to happen. He took me in and he was very much there. In fact when he when I, when I saw him or I thought I saw him, whatever, he said to do pronouns to mm -hmm. me, Which I did. And the the, the legs were as solid as Maheshwarnath Babaji's legs, there was no different. The feet, I'm sorry, not the legs. So... Did he look the same as the images that we have recorded on photographs of him? Yes, yes, absolutely. Did he talk with a voice that you would hear? Yes, physically? yes. Did you spend a lot of time with him? Ten minutes at the most, which is a big time. What was his message to the outside world that supersedes what we know? He didn't say anything to me about that message. He didn't give any message for the outside. You know what he told me? He gave me a list of places to go on pilgrimage. <laughs> he came back to give you a list? Yeah, and most of the thi No, he said something which I don't want to say okay. now. That's a yes, different yes, matter. Yes. But apart from that, he said to go to these places, and not only that, he put his hands into his pocket and gave me a bunch of currency notes. Now. You know, the, it's you mentioned all, that all, earlier. So yeah, it's more all the more serious because uh, it's, uh, a, a phantom, uh, which is just an image, cannot give you money, which is solid. Which, in fact, I had some one coin with me for a long time, and I was wondering what to do with it. Till one day, I couldn't find it. So none of the money he gave you, you have. You either spent it or you lost it. No, he told me to spend it. He didn't ask me to keep it. That's but accidentally, there was some something left which after a while, I don't know where it went, but I misplaced it or it's gone. Somebody would say it might have disappeared, I don't know. But, uh, so I took it and went to all the places which he asked me to go. <laughs> well, we're waiting. We hope there's nothing terrible in your future for a while so that you'll have <laughs> time to record or share maybe with us uh, in writing in your next book. Maybe when you come next, we can. It might be time to discuss. <laughs> to Madhnapali, you're welcome. That's but this time, when you friend. come to Madhnapali, stay for a couple of days. Now we have a guest house. It's nice. Yeah. Yes. 
coin place. I've been there. It is nice. It's very, very yeah. nice. I'm sure it's crowded with people now. No, <laughs> not crowded. Because when I'm there, there's a big crowd. When I'm not, there's hardly Nobody. anybody. So I ask people, go when I'm not there. It's beautiful, quiet, calm. <laughs> Have you found any scientists on this planet who understand where you're coming from? Where I'm coming from? Yeah, it's something that, they can, that you cannot verify. And, and they might ordinarily be skeptical of, but they're listening to you and they come over There are a couple of uh, people I know. One of them, of course, is a very uh, important neurosurgeon who lives in Bangalore. I think he understands in some way that uh, what I'm up to and that there are possibilities of looking into this. In fact, this is something I wanted to tell you. With, sorry, with his help, um, I will, I'm trying to work on a book which I would like to title as uh, the neurological basis of spiritual experience, hmm. which means when spiritual... It's becoming a popular topic. I'm working on yeah. it every I minute. Mean, I have so many things to do that uh, I don't get enough time. But I've done about four chapters or so, and it's kind of in the... And I'm sorry I interrupted you. When you come to a neurological understanding of spiritual... That seems yeah, yeah. What, I, what I was trying to say is that when you have a spiritual experience, there are many things happening in your brain, in the neurological system, in your central nervous system, in your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and in the brain. There are many things happening. So I'm trying to figure out if it's possible to distinguish a man who's just faking and saying that I'm having experience, and a genuine man through understanding the reactions that take place in the brain. You know, this is probably what I'm trying to... you would be one of their test subjects right away. Yeah, yeah. Good. So they can. I'm free to be tested. How about theologians or mystics or religious intellectuals who have read your book, who have heard your story? How do, how do they react to it? Because you've met so many people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're walk for hope. I, I know, have I know, earlier, I 7, know. 7,000 some kilometers, 4,400 miles. Across, in 16 months... At, at almost the age of 70, yeah. you had to be almost out of your mind to yeah. do such a <laughs> Thank, Thankfully, I'm blessed with a lot of energy. So, uh, so uh, this reaction from people, intellectuals, politicians, scientists, uh, you know, there's a wide spectrum out here. And there are some who believe everything that I say. And there are some who don't believe everything, but believe some parts. There are some who feel that they should explore and probably they'll find out about it. And there are some who are skeptics, but who are very friendly with me because they can't understand because they have known me for many years and I don't usually tell lies. So, so if this guy is saying this, either he's mentally gone completely or it can't be, it may be. So even there are, I know, I have good friends among the Marxists. You know that I was born and brought up in Kerala. Sure. As, there's only as state... As a Muslim. Hmm, as a Muslim. And that's the only state in India which still has a Marxist government, even today. They would not have guessed that. Yeah. And even they have some understanding with me. They feel that this guy... There's some substance to what he's saying. Marxism is atheism too, isn't it? Yeah. So I have no con. You resonate with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not in conflict with their ideology. <laughs> I'm more about the human being. Whether they can improve or can you bring about a revolution by killing thousands of people? This is what I disagree with. The beliefs they can keep to themselves. I believe that God exists. Somebody else believes God doesn't exist. It's your belief against his. A reality, unless you find out, you don't know. On some level, as a, as a person who's asked many questions over the course of many years, I have to think that each of us has a different point where we're brought across the fence into a deeper understanding or the appetite for deeper understanding. And that's why I ask these. So let me just ask a couple of more questions that I had at the very bottom. It has to do with the subject of meditation, yeah. which in the West, this is important. So, yeah. I find that so difficult to do. The... Um, the monkey minds that we all seem to have, 
make it almost impossible for us to meditate for very long. You learned Kriya Yoga from yeah. your master. Yeah. You initiate people into Kriya Yes, I do. How can you describe them? How, to, how can you inform them to practice that effectively while the mind chatters away so much? There's very important points here. One is when you get initiated into Kriya Yoga, on one hand, you are learning how precisely to quieten this monkey mind, what you called monkey mind. This is one of the things in Kriya, is precisely how to quieten this monkey mind. So, when you practice Kriya, it's not as if you're trying to make your mind quiet and calm and free of thought. You're trying to engage yourself fully in a practice which gradually deepens your understanding and goes within. Mm -hmm. It's not as if on day one you're able to be free of all this jumping of the mind or the chatter of the mind. No, but through practice you learn how to find an island in the midst of this choppy sea. Uh, it takes practice. But I must also say that when we initiate somebody, Along with what we teach, a certain energy goes to the other person, which in seed form sits inside that person and empowers him to manage his mind. So it's important if you read about Kriya Yoga and it doesn't work, somebody has to give it to you. So it's not just staying with the practice until it improves gradually, it's what also, comes, it's also yeah, what comes in yeah, at the same yeah. time. I've never heard it expressed that way before. Yeah, because we have to plant a seed. It may not be the whole thing, but it will be a seed that is sitting inside and sprouting at its own pace. And it depends on different people, there are different paces. It cannot be at the same time. But people definitely see an improvement. And then your center in Madhna Pali, your, your beautiful little estate, uh, ashram, you have a, a, a meditation center where I think I always saw somebody in there practicing. Yeah. Um, I have is, a room. Is, is it a major part of your teaching? How would you describe your teaching? How would you describe your mission to others? You are a lecturer, you are an author, you teach meditation and you, practice, and you initiate people. Um. I initiate people only if they are willing to be initiated into Kriya Yoga. If somebody is doing something else, which is not the Kriya Yoga that I teach, and if I find that they are doing okay, I don't try to persuade them and make them take Kriya also. So for me, Kriya is not a mission. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, um, there are people who don't practice any... I always, Babaji used to ask me this question, Mirabai did not practice any Kriya the great uh, saint Mirabai, he used to say, well, what Kriya did she practice? Nothing. So, don't think you're very special. <laughs> I mean, it is his way of saying, don't get very egotistic, but still the same. And Ramana Maharshi, on the other hand, what Kriya did he practice? Nothing. So, it's, I don't believe that Kriya is the only way and that without Kriya you will not uh, you cannot move forward in spiritual... I don't believe this. Neither did Maheshwanath Babaji believe in nor did Sri Guru Babaji believe in this. But it is a potent technique. And those who are willing to experiment and to take it, once it's given, we do see a marked in improvement in our progress. That's... yes. Yeah. One very related concept from six years ago. I remember when you told me that you were sorry to report that you had not yet met any serious spiritual students. Have you met any since then? People who really followed what you have to say and practice them correctly. No, no, correction. They don't have to follow everything that I say. They don't have to. But what I meant by since he's a seeker is one whose only interest is to find the truth. It's difficult to find such people. That would be a seeker. Uh, a real seeker. 
uh, who is not interested in anything else. No paraphernalia is not interested. If I tell him, hey, you be with me for six days and I'll teach you a trick by which you can produce ash, he's not interested. He says, no, I don't want that. And you made it quite clear. Because I, the softening of the heart. Yeah. You got I, I would tell head. him that even PC Sarkar can do that. It's no big deal. But then he says, I don't want all that. Then what do you want? I want to be free of the conditionings of my mind. And there is nothing else I'm interested in. Uh, I wouldn't say I haven't found. I think I've found a couple of people. I don't want to give names. That's fair. It's an improvement. And we think after all these years, almost my 70 hope. years, you find my a hope. couple of people. <laughs> uh, one last question. Six years ago, you also told me you were going to write a book, The Past Four Lives of M. How is that coming? Well, I've already written that book. It's called The Journey Continues. Oh, so you changed it. It has six, six or seven lives, maybe. <laughs> six or seven lives. <laughs> You question whether or not, if you had past lives about 20 minutes ago, is that a question mark that's very big in your mind? I didn't get that. Do you under Do you fully believe that you've had past lives? Of course, it's not a belief for me; it's an experience for me. And you were gifted with the insight of knowing yes. about yes. what you learned in those yes. past lives. Yes, I I did very hard work. I hope you. At some point, you read the journey continues. I, will. I didn't know that was it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's the promise that I kept, uh, what I told you. And if you read the journey continues, you'll see how hard I had to work myself to get to where I stay now. Well, that's a humbling experience for you. That's good for us to hear. Absolutely, I think because it's not. Some people come and say, "Oh, in one year nothing is happening," so I think I'll go find somebody. I said, "Please do." Mm -hmm. Hard work. You have to several lives. But then, when you realize, when you come to a certain stage and you cross a, the the gate, then you might figure out that you have practiced life. You don't know now. Right. That's the important difference. Yes. We we just can't draw from that exactly. wealth of understanding that we're not conscious. Yes. Of having yes. Yes. Because you don't know. Because we don't know. We can't say it doesn't exist. I wonderfully enjoyed your talk last night. It was a packed house. People there were enthralled with it as much as I was and my guests here. Um, it's a difference between an interview and a talk, and I apologize for going down so much in some details. <laughs> That's you okay. bring new light. Okay. You bring new light that you don't often talk, that you don't always talk yeah, about every yeah. time you give it. There's talk. no point in talking in public about certain things. Yeah. Because nobody's interested. Why would I waste my time? You don't think that. Don't think nobody's interested. Please don't think that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, because also there are more important issues on hand. Yeah. You know that I need to make them move from where they stand and come to a position where maybe at some future date they can see what I can see. So I try to concentrate on that. I will conclude by saying years ago I discovered I was a fence traveler. I knew how little I knew about anything but I knew there was more to learn if only somebody would point the way. So my wife, Jody Cleary, instructed me, she suggested to me that we start doing these interviews and they spontaneously went around the world because of the, because of the power of Google and YouTube and mm -hmm, video mm -hmm. to 150 countries yeah. by people who were fence travelers yeah. looking for right. guidance. Right. So this is where so much can be said. My, so <laughs> so I'm dividing the teachings into two sections. One is what I teach in public, mm -hmm. and one is when I talk intimately to people yes. like you on the camera. Yeah. And some of they us can are, be put together. Some of us are in both camps. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> so we need to put them together. Yeah. So my last comment to you is a question. Just please speak from your most inner instincts about telling others what it is that you would like them to keep uppermost in their consciousness to help them on this path? If they are on the path, yes. then the most important thing to keep in mind is a one-pointed trust to finding the goal. Mm -hmm. And to remember that in this, when you pursue this path, it's a tough path. The Upanishads have called it walking on the razor's edge, Sura Siddhara. So 
You know, Somerset Maugham wrote a book called The Raises the Peace Corps in the 60s, yes. Raises Edge. And Raises Edge was very influential yeah, in people's lives. Yes, and he wrote that novel after meeting Ramana Maharshi. Few people know that. I didn't know he met him. Yes. I knew he was in India, but I didn't know he met him. Yeah. So, uh, in this path, there are many obstacles, there are many distractions that can come. So one, this one-pointedness to say, whatever happens, I need to reach this, I need to understand this. Second, whatever obstacles come on the way, I'm ready to handle it, no matter what problems they bring to me, sorrow, pain, grief, I'm going to do it. That is, I think, the most important thing in this. Your viewers, who are legendary, want to hear more about, because they may have missed your first comments on these detailed mm -hmm. little nuggets, mm -hmm. Please go to soldiers.net. You have a way of bringing it out. <laughs> <laughs> Please go to soldiers.net, S-O-U-L-J-O-U-R-N-S. And if you have any questions or admonitions or, or, or inquiries to me, just write to me at newsguy55 at AOL.com, N-E-W-S-G-U-I, 55 at AOL.com. Sri M, when are we going to meet again? Whenever you want. <laughs> I'm always happy to meet you. I, so you, it came after six years. I'm very pleased, very happy. But you can come again, meet me, come to Madhnapalli. We'll make you come to beautiful downtown Burbank again one day. That's Maybe next now. year I'll be back. Good. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Thank and you. until Thank you we much. meet again. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all who are here. Thank yes. you. And Ted especially. <laughs> Thank you.